Welcome to another video. Here we're going to discuss uh, what is perhaps the most important topic in economics, and that is innovation. And it's really so important because innovation is the source of economic growth. And because it's so important, I'd like to say that economists really understand it well. Uh, unfortunately, that is not always the case, um, as we'll see. But we'll talk about some of the things that we do understand and some of the things that, uh, you know, the role that government plays and the things that government needs to balance in both encouraging innovation and then allowing that innovation to uh, spread out through the economy. So this is going to follow uh, chapter 21 of uh, the core textbook, uh, Innovation, Information, and the Networked Economy. We'll talk especially about the digital economy, but we want to focus on innovation uh, in general as well. So innovation is really the source of economic growth. Um, and as we saw in, you know, chapters one and two um, in the book, economic growth is really what has allowed us to uh, live a life that's really almost unimaginable uh, 300 years ago, 200 years ago, even 100 years ago. Um, and one issue, of course, is that, you know, once knowledge is created, uh, it becomes a public good um, so that it can be difficult to get the benefits of increasing that knowledge. And so we'll see that there are some areas where the government can uh, play an important role in producing that knowledge and some areas where the private sector uh, can protect that knowledge, um, especially through government policies. So we also want to think about what encourages innovation. We'll see, we'll take a look at the end of this video at some differences, say, between Silicon Valley and, um, you know, the German economy, which is probably an oversimplification, but um, it shows that there's, there's more than one way to uh, encourage innovation. Um, and we'll think about also later in the chapter, you know, technological innovation uh, and labor markets. So if we think about the different types of innovation, uh, there's really sort of two big pieces, right? One is process innovation. And that's really the innovation that we've thought about more in, say, a chapter two, where we think about an increase in the production function. And that's basically producing an existing good at lower cost, right? So getting more output uh, with fewer inputs. Uh, so you can think of, you know, process innovation in terms of agriculture, uh, manufacturing, um, but then there's also product innovation and product innovation is producing a new good. And often what happens, of course, is that we get a product innovation and that product innovation is something new that we haven't had before, but it might not work very well. It might be really expensive. Um, and then through process innovation, that good gets better and better and cheaper and cheaper. Um, so it's really hard to separate the two, but we can sort of think about them as two different categories. Um, and we can also think about, you know, that's related to sort of radical innovation and incremental in innovation, where radical innovation is a, a large leap forward. But again, of course, that's kind of a, a judgment call in terms of, you know, what's radical versus incremental. There's nothing ever comes out of nothing. Uh, and so, you know, even the new, you know, say the, the iPhone in 2007, you could definitely argue that that was a radical innovation. But um, we had cell phones before, we had these, you know, uh, screens before. It was really just putting it all together into a, a new product. Um, we can also sort of think about, you know, sort of general purpose technologies that can spread throughout the uh, economy. So obviously, you know, things like electricity and transportation, uh, things like the internet, um, all of those have, you know, sort of spread throughout industry and really contributed to growth. Uh, and then there's going to be a question about whether, you know, innovation and the knowledge that comes from it can be codified and written down and, and perhaps therefore protected in something like a patent system or a copyright system uh, versus tacit knowledge, um, which maybe either isn't written down, can't be written down uh, and sort of gets passed on maybe within a firm or within an industry um, more broadly. So why do firms want to innovate? Well, obviously, they want to profit from that innovation, right? And so um, often when we think about innovation, uh, there's going to be some cost. Um, and, you know, this is true of things like research and development groups in, in large firms. Obviously, there are some innovations that, that happen through, uh, you know, good luck and serendipity. Uh, but most will happen through, you know, focused efforts. They'll come with some upfront fixed cost. 
uh, and that will allow the firm to develop a new product, develop a new process, and therefore get innovation rents uh, and higher profits, right? And so there's going to be some period of higher profits before the invention is copied by others. That time might be protected by government policy, like a patent. It might be just that uh, other firms take a while to figure out how to do it. Um, but then once that invention is copied by others, then profits will go back to, to zero, right? And remember, we're talking about zero economic profits as opposed to zero uh, accounting profits. Um, but from, an, from a sort of economy-wide point of view, that diffusion is what's going to be really important, right? Um, when that invention gets spread out through the economy and at a lower cost through competition, that's when um, everybody will benefit from that innovation. So when we think about an innovation system, what we're really talking about is the you know, government policies, laws, social norms that allow innovation to happen in an economy, right? And if you think about you know, innovation, as we said in, in chapters one and two, has sort of happened throughout human history. Uh, but it happened at a very, very slow pace until we sort of got into the Renaissance and then got into um, the industrial and capitalist revolutions. And you could really think about capitalism itself as providing that system uh, that allows for innovation and that allows for sort of continuous economic growth. So we want to think about all of the different players involved in an innovation system and how they uh, interrelate, right? So we're talking about entrepreneurs, we're talking about scientists, we're talking about government, we're talking about private firms, um, and all of the sort of policies that can be put in place, all of the, the laws that we need. Um, but we also don't want to think that there's only one way to do this, right? Um, so I think if we look across history, if we look across the world, we can see that there are lots of different successful innovation systems. Um, and so we want to think about those um, separately. I should also note that, you know, we're talking about sort of this is really more focused on developed countries, right? Those who are sort of pushing the envelope. If we think about less developed countries, you know, some of the things that we need, we need, you know, this innovation system in place. We need things like, um, you know, protections for, for private property. We need things like public education, um, things like roads. All of those things will allow uh those types of economies to adopt the latest technologies um, and hopefully get up to that level so that they can then start pushing uh the innovation envelope as well so the book has this example between uh silicon valley in you know the information and communications technology world and the german innovation system and we don't need to go too much into the details i think that the biggest difference perhaps is you know, the um, sort of reliance on, on patents, on intellectual property protection in, in the Silicon Valley world um, versus the more sort of cooperative uh, world in the German innovation system. Government plays a big role in both. Um, so, you know, the government in uh, the German system, I think, is re really focused both on sort of training workers, but then also focused on um, the export industry. Um, where, you know, they, their goal is really to be competitive on a global scale so that exports are successful. Um, Silicon Valley, I mean, they're definitely focused on exports, but, you know, the U.S. economy is larger. They can probably be successful in the U.S. economy. Um, higher education is really important in U.S. Uh, innovation. So a lot of uh, funding from the government will go through uh, the university system. Um, but also through things like, you know, DARPA and military contracts. And, you know, in terms of the innovators, right, it's going to be the people who, who have the skills, right? So whether that's uh, engineers, scientists, entrepreneurs, uh, universities, um, they're going to be the, the innovators really in, in both uh, systems. So we're going to sort of continue talking about in the next few videos, uh, innovation and think really about both, you know, where innovation comes from, um, the balance between protecting innovators' rights to profit from their innovations and the desire to have it diffused through the economy more broadly, um, 
And we can think about specific things like the patent system, like the copyright system, where there's a fair amount of debate uh, in the economy, you know, in the economics world about how much protection there should be.